Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for joining us in more than 130 countries around the world, making this one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts anywhere on the entire planet. We appreciate you raising your health IQ with us today. And today, Let's talk about olive oil for starters, right? Olive oil, it is loaded in fat, it is loaded in calories, but does that mean though you shouldn't be eating it? Is it really as bad for you as a triple chili cheeseburger or the enormous bag of fries that comes with it? Or is olive oil kind of the exception to the fatty rule? Well, we will be finding out today because there is a new study out that found that olive oil is not just good for your heart, but it can lower your risk of cancer and all cause mortality AKA pretty much every other way to die. But are those results really accurate? And what does previous research suggest? We're gonna find out today. And the man answering those questions, is it time to rethink olive oil? Dr. Neil Barnard is here with us on the exam room live as we open up the doctor's mailbag and making his exam room live debut today. Very excited also to have Dr. Josh Cullimore with us. So if you have a question for the good doctors, go ahead and post that in the comments or in the chat. We're gonna to get to as many as we possibly can. You can also send them to me right now on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Chuck Carroll WLC. So let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Barnard to the show and Dr. Cullimore to the show for for the very first time. Guys, thank you so very much for being here. Hey there, Chuck, it's great to see you. Josh, I'm, I'm really happy that you're here for the very first time. But Dr. Barnard, let's go ahead and start with you. Let's talk about olive oil before we dive into anything else and take Jeremy's question. And Jeremy's question is, is olive oil healthy even though it's high in fat? Well, what a great question. And it, you know, it's a question that comes up not just for people at home, but for also their doctors too, because doctors are encouraged to recommend olive oil. Um, number one, olive oil is better than chicken fat, beef fat, uh, cheese fat, dairy fat. It's better than all these. Why do I say it's better? Because if you send it to a lab and you say, how much of this oil is saturated fat? That's the one that raises cholesterol. It's a lot less than chicken fat. Chicken fat is 30% saturated fat. Beef is 50% saturated fat. But for olive oil, it's all the way down to 14. That's good. Um, the researchers, the, the new study, big study came out from Harvard University, a nurses health study combined with the health professionals follow-up study. Huge number of people. And they found that if you substitute butter or other kinds of dairy fat, for in, 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 you take those out and you put in olive oil instead, it would help all kinds of health issues, including you know, whether, whether you live or die. And a big meta-analysis from Greece came out and said, uh, specifically, it's going to reduce your cancer risk. That's all good. However, a big caveat here. What if instead of cooking in chicken fat, I cook in olive oil? That's good, less saturated fat. But what if instead... I get a nonstick pan and I don't use any fat at all. That's best of all, because every gram of fat, no matter where it's from, has nine calories. And our research has shown that when people get away from these fats in general, they do best of all. So olive oil, better than animal fats, absolutely slam dunk, but learning to really minimize even the oils, even the olive oil is probably the best, uh, best road. Yeah, and that was that was going to be my question to you, Dr. Barnard, was is it really the olive oil or the fact that they're not eating that chicken fat anymore or they're not eating butter any longer? You know, like, which is it? Is olive oil the magic ticket here or is it just the fact that they're not eating that other stuff? The researchers have tried to make uh, the case that there's something magical in olive oil. And, and there are various plant constituents, just as there are in broccoli and sweet potatoes. Um, however, the big issue seems to be you're not eating the animal fat anymore. There's, there's one other piece of this, Chuck, that you're kind of putting your finger on. There's something we call publication bias. When researchers find good news about something people wanted to eat anyway, they often publish those findings. If they find bad news about it, for whatever reason, the researchers are kind of slow to send it into journals. And the, the Greek researchers, the ones in Athens who did a meta-analysis, they looked and they said, it looks to us like olive oil, better for you than other fats, but it also looks like a whole bunch of researchers are not publishing 
negative findings because they're a little bit afraid of it. Important caveat there. But yeah. let's shift from the fat in olive oil over to that dairy fat that you were talking about a little bit. And Dr. Cullimore, your very first question is going to be about that. We have a question from Cindy who sent a copy of a study and was like, listen, this study says that dairy fat is good for your heart. So can fat from milk and cheese actually prevent a heart attack? Uh, thanks so much, Chuck, for, for having me on. Um, and that's also a great question because that study got a lot of media attention um, last year. And uh, unfortunately, there are many, many flaws with that study. So um, no, dairy, dairy fat does, does not reduce your risk of heart disease. What, one of the biggest problems with that study was they measured a fatty acid in the blood of um, thousands of people that they said um, was a marker for dairy intake, how much dairy products people were eating. But in fact, what they didn't say is that same fatty acid um, is also um, uh, an indicator of how much fiber um, people eat. And we have very, very good evidence that the more fiber you eat, the lower your risk of heart disease. So it, it's, it's not specific to dairy at all. Um, and, and there were other problems with the study. They, they weren't actually showing what um, people were eating instead of the, the dairy, what they were comparing it to. If people were eating lots of meat or eggs, for example. So there were lots of problems, but the big, biggest one really was they weren't measuring what they said they were measuring. When a patient comes to you and they want to ask you about a study like this, I mean, how do you know, it, it always to me just seems too good to be true uh, with things like this, uh, a study like this. It's like eat all the cheese that you want, drink all the milk that you want, and you're going to live forever because you won't have a heart attack. Uh, similarly, when they have the studies uh, out that show that red meat is supposedly good for you uh, and will keep you uh, making a few more trips around the sun. How do you deal with it um, to kind of I don't know. I don't want to say let the patient down gently, but I mean, how do you approach this with your patient to be like, eh, you really want to rethink this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, an issue really is that, that, as Dr. Barnard was saying, not only is there publication uh, bias, there is um, a bias in, in patients, the general public. In, in reading those stories, clicking on those stories that tell them that it's good to eat the things they, they like eating. So I, I think um, it really is a matter of just e explaining the facts, um, explaining the, the problems with these particular studies and just giving reassurance that uh, actually they really won't miss those unhealthy foods um, after a few weeks once their, their taste buds have adjusted. And a, a plant-based diet is actually delicious and they, they wish they would have done it a long time ago. There you go. Just just let them down gently, Dr. Cullimore, when, when you kind of like burst their bubble a little bit, just let them down gently. Um, Dr. Barnard, let's shift back to dairy here for a second. We have a good question from Carol. And how often have you heard this? I could go vegan, but I just can't give up the cheese. She's struggling with that. And she's wondering, why is cheese so addictive? You know, I have to say so many people have been in exactly this position. And I'm, I'm glad that she raised it because when we've done research studies, people come in, they change their diets because they've got diabetes or they want to lose weight and they get away from animal products and they do great. I mean, their lives are just transformed. But they'll often say exactly what she says. The thing that I, I miss is cheese, specifically cheese, not yogurt, not chicken wings, specifically cheese. And you think, why? It smells like old socks. Why do people crave cheese? Um, and the reason probably is, well, people like things that are salty. There's a lot of salt in cheese. They like things that are fatty. Uh, and the fatty, salty combination is what makes French fries and potato chips and onion rings so attractive. But cheese has all that and mild opiate traces. Um, there are chemicals that the cow made that are called casomorphins. They're in dairy. They are particularly concentrated in the cheese. Uh, we believe that cows make it and put it in their milk as a way of sort of calming the baby. It's maybe even some researchers call it part of the mother infant bond. But when you turn milk into cheese, those casomorphins are concentrated. 
Um, and some of them are, uh, well, they're all opiates, but, but some of them are, are surprisingly strong. And so it's not enough to get you arrested, but it's enough to make you love cheese because it has a bit of a drug effect. And that, that suddenly makes sense. That makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Um, Dr. Cullimore, let's come back to you. Uh, let's continue talking about fat, this time a little bit different. Let's talk about a plant-based fat. Amelia has a question, wants to know, is coconut milk as bad for you as coconut oil? Um, no, coconut milk isn't as bad. It only has about a, a quarter of the, the saturated fat of coconut oil. Um, however, having said that, it, uh, coconut milk still has a much higher saturated fat content than, than other plant milks. Um, it's about a hundred times more than, than that in soya milk, for example. So, um, yeah, it's all relative. Definitely avoid coconut oil. Um, but you know, occasional coconut milk, um, should be okay for most people, but, um, if you can, I would, I would prefer to go for, for other plant milks. Let's go then to uh, a question from Angela. Uh, Dr. Cullimore, coming right back to you for this one. She's wondering about cholesterol. Angela wants to know, why could cholesterol levels actually increase when someone begins to eat a healthy vegan diet and is active? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, you're finding that because... Um, usually a plant-based diet really does bring cholesterol down levels quite quickly uh, but there, there are certain things to look out for um, just to check with the diet that you're not drinking too much alcohol um, avoiding uh, unfiltered coffee that can actually to increase your cholesterol levels um, and but then there's other things like stress chronic stress um, pregnancy menopause um, it's worth getting your liver and um, kidney levels and your thyroid levels checked as well. So definitely speak to your doctor about this. Um, but um, unfortunately, a small percentage of people have a, a genetic predisposition to high cholesterol. Um, so yeah, a few things to discuss with your with your doctor. Uh, Dr. Well, Barnes? Let me jump in. Let me jump in on that one too, because um, Dr. Cullen or and I were talking about this uh, earlier that there are. If this was five years ago, um, so many people, they go on a vegan diet and their cholesterol levels fall pretty uniformly. But in recent years, we're starting to see somebody where they get worse. And I call this the impossible phenomenon. Um, our friends, Pat, Pat Brown and others who have been devising impossible burgers and things like that, they put in so much coconut fat that it'll seduce a meat eater into eating the veggie burger but it's completely different from the veggie burgers that used to be there a few years ago. It's so high in saturated fat that if a person tucked into those, their cholesterol level could actually rise. So it's really a question of not only avoiding the animal products, but also keeping oils low and doing what Dr. Cullimore mentioned. He said, look at that package, coconut milk. Maybe that's not the best choice. And when you're looking at products, so often the palm oil or the coconut oil have been creeping in, and those are going to raise your cholesterol too. So you might want to throw those out. Do you have a, a particular plant milk that you would gravitate toward for, uh, you know, just saying overall this may be the, the best of the bunch? Is it almond? Is it soy? I'm going to give you a quick prejudice, but I want to see what Josh has to say about this. I, to tell you the truth, I kind of miss soy milk. Because soy milk used to be the milk that was everywhere. And because of paranoid reasons... I'm talking about urban mythology. People got the idea that soy products would give men breasts and give women cancer. And both have, are not true at all. So as, as we've talked talk on this show before, before Chuck, uh, soy reduces cancer risk for women and for men. It, it reduces cancer mortality in breast cancer. It has nothing to do with man boobs, is the, which is the, the locker room term for it. Um, that comes from men gaining weight and their body fat makes estrogen. So anyway, soy milk has gotten a bad name, and I'm, for one, I'm going to speak up for our friend, the soybean. Uh, Josh, Cut, yeah. Josh, what, I know, Josh, you've done lots of work on, on different milks, and is there one that you think really kind of stands out? Well, I, I agree with you, um, Dr. Barnard, that uh, it's really frustrating that soy milk has had such a, a bad reputation, and it's completely undeserved. It's got so many health benefits, like you say, reduced risk of certain cancers, 
lowers your cholesterol, um, it's high in um, protein and um, omega-3 uh, fatty acids. So it, it really is a, a, a great a great food um, and, and it's tasty. Um, so I, I tend to go for uh, soya milk when I can, um, although oat milk is, is pretty good too, especially in tea. Uh, and oats can lower your cholesterol as well. There you go. And, and trust the tea tip. Somebody from the UK talking about tea, you know that that advice is spot on, my friends. Um, Dr. Barnard, coming to you now, uh, we have a question about hypothyroidism. And I know that this is something that you covered extensively in your book, Your Body Imbalance. So this question from Christian is this, what can be done to improve a diet to help hypothyro hypothyroidism if someone is already eating a low fat vegan diet? Good, okay, great question. Um, really under appreciated issue. So many people have all kinds of health issues. They've never been to a doctor to even check their thyroid level. It's easy to do and a good idea. Uh, you get out of bed in the morning, you stand on the scale, I've gained another pound. You look in the mirror and you think, I don't, my skin doesn't look right, my hair doesn't look right. You go to the doctor and the doctor says, this may sound vague to you, but to me, this sounds like hypothyroidism. So there, there are two things that the doctor is going to think about and you should be thinking about too. Number one is iodine. What do you have for iodine? Um, iodine is something in seaweed, sea vegetables. Um, so the nori that sushi is wrapped in or the wakame that's in your miso soup, great sources of iodine. Uh, but of course, if you live in North Dakota, like where I grew up, we don't think about that. Bring them back into your diet. If you're not doing that, you might think about iodized salt. That's right. If you're using Himalayan salt or sea salt, it may not be iodized. So bring the iodized salt back into your life uh, for when you're using salt. Um, or there are also iodine tablets that are kel kelporite. That's gonna get you on track with your iodine. Don't overdo it. You need just 150 micrograms a day. You, you, more is not better. Um, the second thing, and you're already doing this, which is good, avoiding the animal products. Researchers at the Adventist Health Study 2 found that the people who are eating dairy, people who are eating meat, people who are eating eggs, seem to have a higher risk of developing the antibodies that can shut down their thyroid. So avoiding all that's important too. So make sure your iodine's okay, avoid the animal products. And then some people may need supplementation from their doctor despite their best efforts, but your doctor can help you with that. All right, Dr. Barnard, sticking with you, going to do a hard pivot to another topic altogether. This is a question from Tony, and they are wondering, is a plant-based diet, which includes whole grains, is that a good diet for someone who has both the APOE4 genes? We think so. Yeah, um, this has been such an important thing. It, what we're talking about here is Alzheimer's. Um, you go to the doctor, the doctor can do a blood test. And if you have the APO, what's called the APOE epsilon 4 gene, or allele is the technical term for it, your risk is tripled. Your, your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease at some point in life is three times what it would have been otherwise. If you got it from mom and from dad, what we call homozygous, um, your risk is 10 to 15 times higher. Up until, oh, maybe 10 years ago, we considered this sort of a death sentence. However, researchers in Finland did a fascinating study. They piggybacked on earlier findings that showed that people who really avoid saturated fat, what, what Dr. Cullimore was talking about earlier, when you really avoid the saturated fat, your risk of developing memory problems in older age is substantially reduced. And even among people who happen to have this specific genetic profile, the diet change seems to have a, a strongly protective effect. How strong? Uh, when they were looking at mild cognitive impairment, which is the first step into Alzheimer's, uh, where you're, you're having a lot of memory lapses, the risk of that was cut by 80% among the people avoiding saturated fat, even when they had the genes. So uh, you can't replace your genes, but what you can do is replace your breakfast. And so um, we think that this is, is going to help. Uh, a great many people. Let's cross our fingers and hope that turns out to be true. Dr. Cullen Moore, I know you're sitting there patiently. I'm going to come back to you in just a moment, but Dr. Barnard, I want to stick with you and take a question from Anna because it 
goes to something you and I have talked about previously with Alzheimer's, and that is the role that iron may play in terms of somebody's risk. And Anna is wondering whether coffee can block iron absorption. Um, it does. Um, coffee will reduce iron absorption a lot, about 50%. Um, interestingly enough, milk will do the same thing. Uh, some people are drinking milk because they want to get the mineral calcium, but it blocks the absorption of iron in the body. Yeah. So sorry to say it's true. Does that go for all milks or are we talking just dairy milk there? Oh, I'm sorry. That's dairy milk. Gotcha. Um, dairy, dairy milk re reduces iron absorption by coffee. Yeah, it'll do the same. All right. Good, good transition here. You did that for me so naturally. Dr. Cullimore, <laughs> coming to you for this one, you're talking milk. You got to talk about calcium. Barbara is wondering, though, does calcium absorption differ when it comes to cooked greens versus raw greens? Yes, it does. Um the, the absorption is better when they're cooked, um, about double to a, a third increase in absorption. Um, but there, there's pros and cons of, of cooking and uh, or having raw vegetables. You get more or less nutrients uh, from different vegetables, um, different nutrients. So I, I wouldn't be too concerned, just a mixture, um, you know, to have a, a tasty diet, you, you, you'll be fine. All right. Uh, let's let's stick with you. You talk about uh, a tasty diet. What's a tasty diet without some tasty snacks here? Let's give some practical advice. Pam is wondering, what what suggestions do you have, Dr. Cullimore, for some healthy vegan snacks? I'm sure she's wondering about grab and go items. The easier, the better. Yeah. OK, well, I mean, to be honest, fruit is what I, I choose myself because it's it's packaged already by nature. Um, really, really easy, very tasty. Um, you know, once you've, you've cut out a lot of processed um, sugar, actually fruit tastes incredibly sweet and is, is really tasty. So that's probably my go to. Um, but there's, there's lots of great recipes on the PCRM website, um, pcrm.org forward slash recipes. So I would have a look there. Um, there's, there's a really tasty one um, from Dr. Barnard's um, book, um, Your Body in Balance. Um, apple pie nachos um, that I've tried that were really delicious. That, oh, I've forgotten about the apple pie nachos. I had forgotten about those. My goodness gracious, those are good. Mm, 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 mm. I might have to do that. Um, Dr. Cullimore, because this is your first time on the show, um, how long have you been eating a plant-based diet? I'm just curious. So um, 12 years, 13 years this year, I've been completely plant-based. Good and, deals. Um, yeah, meat free for six years before that. So, so uh, what what were the snacks that you were eating uh, prior to adopting the healthy plant based diet versus the fruit that you're eating today? Um, yeah, so I would unfortunately um, uh, be eating lots of uh, cakes with uh, cream and milk products in them. Um, yeah, that was probably my biggest weakness, to be honest, was, was cake. <laughs> what what tips do you have for somebody who is in the shoes that you once were and wants to make that same transition? What tips do you have for them to kind of get them away from the cakes and over to the healthier options? Yeah, so there's lots of you know, easy transitional products um, these days. Uh, and, and we were talking about milks. That's a really easy thing to, to switch. Um and then there are veggie burgers, as Dr. Barnard says, try to avoid the ones that are, have um, lots of coconut oil in. Um, but yeah, just small um, steps over a few weeks, do some research on easy things you can you could swap. Um, hummus is great with um, carrots or cucumber, whole grain crackers. Um, yeah, just... Um, like I say, take it slowly over a few weeks. And then once you've got some ideas, I would highly recommend signing up to the 21 day kickstart app, which will give you some daily motivation and recipes and tips. And it just so happens there's a link to that app right now in the show description or in the episode notes. So go ahead and click on that. Uh, it is a great, great, great app to get you going your first three weeks eating that plant-based diet. Uh, Dr. Cullimore, sticking with you, we were talking about transitions there, but let's talk about another food transition that occurs way earlier in life. Take a question from Holly, who is wondering, how should she transition her one-year-old from formula? What should she go to next? Because she says, 
really the next step as she understands it is whole milk. Okay, well, no, uh, one year old definitely doesn't need whole milk. Uh, in fact, there's lots of health reasons to avoid whole milk, um, including later risks of, of cancer. Um, so, and, and heart disease, the saturated fat starts clogging up the, the arteries very early in life. So yeah, avoid the, the, the cow's milk. From one years old, um, children should really be relying on solid foods um, as much as possible, um, topped up with some, some breast milk if, if she can breastfeed um, till about the age of two. Um, if not, as we were saying, soya milk is a, is a great option. Go for the, the one that is enriched with calcium, has just as much calcium as, as cow's milk. So there's really no need to worry about calcium. Um, yeah, and just um, healthy foods like um, tofu, um, mashed beans are all high in protein and um, avoid uh, whole foods like um, uh, grapes or nuts that could cause choking. But otherwise, yeah, from one years old, um, solid foods like hummus. Um, is, yes, again, some good recipes on, on our website for that. You ever opened uh, like a, a jar of baby food and, and it's just like sweet potatoes? It's not bad. I mean, it sounds so weird to try that, but I was I was in a position one time. I was like, eh, let me let me just see what's happening. And it was just sweet potatoes. It's not half bad. The, the kid's going to love it. So uh, load them up, man. Load them up. Uh, Dr. Barnard, let's come over to you, uh, do another hard pivot here. Let's talk cookware. Why not? It's been a while since we brought this up. Kevin has a question. Aluminum versus steel which is best for cooking whole grains? Take your aluminum pots that are in your kitchen cupboards and bring them to a dumpster and throw them all away. The reason that I say that is researchers years ago started testing aluminum levels in drinking water. They did this in England, they did it in France, they've done it in Canada. And those places where there's the more, more aluminum in the drinking water have much higher risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to other areas. Now, this has become a big controversy in the neurology literature as to whether aluminum contributes to Alzheimer's disease. But the reason that I say don't cook with aluminum at all is because we know several things. In industrial accidents, when people are exposed to aluminum, it's a clear-cut neurotoxin. Number two, the body doesn't need aluminum at all. It tries to avoid it. You, you need iron, you need copper, you need other elements. You don't need aluminum. Your body tries to get rid of it. And you're just adding it when you're cooking something and the food touches the aluminum in your pot, some of that aluminum gets in the food. Don't, you know, you don't want to be in the experimental group when it comes to cancer risk. Stainless steel, perfectly fine, go with it. Um, and also if you've got a nonstick pan, that's fine too. Um, and I would suggest if you get a brand like Made In or a Demeyer or others, get a brand of nonstick. The, the Teflon will not flake off into your food. That, that's 1960s stuff. The, the, the nonstick ones are fine. But get one that's the layer under the nonstick is stainless steel, not aluminum. There's a lot of them where aluminum is right underneath that nonstick level, layer. And I don't think you want that. Uh, Dr. Barnard, sticking with you here, let's take two more really quickly. First one comes to us from Linda. Linda is wondering what foods can help with gallstones? Ah, gallstones. If you take after surgery, your doctor shows you the, jar, the gallstones that came out of your body. Um, they send them to a lab and they're made of cholesterol. So the things that lower your own blood cholesterol level will also reduce your likelihood of developing gallstones. So what does that mean? That means avoiding cholesterol, which is in animal products, never in plants. It means avoiding animal fat and frankly, saturated fats in general, like coconut oil or palm oil, because when you avoid the saturated fat, your cholesterol level goes down. And lastly, this is another argument for high fiber foods. Um, high fiber, fiber foods um, tend to bring cholesterol down a little extra. Um, I'm thinking about oats, for example, uh, soy may do the same. So getting away from animal products, making sure that you're um, avoiding the saturated fat in general, your cholesterol level should come down. Good for your heart, also good for your gallbladder. All right, final question, Dr. Barnard, sticking with you uh, once again. This is a really interesting one. Been doing this show, what, we're in our fifth season. Never once has this come up. Question from Natalia. 
She writes, since being vegan, I don't feel lethargic after I eat. Does this mean that vegans do not need to wait the recommended 30 minutes after eating before going swimming? <laughs> I, two interesting things. Uh, first, yes. I, I, I don't think you have to wait. You can jump in the pool if you want to. The old idea of waiting um, was, I think, a little bit of mythology, really. So if you want to go swimming right after lunch, go ahead. Um, your stomach might thank you if you wait for a little while, but from, from a health standpoint, it's perfectly fine. But the other thing is, why do you have more energy now that you've gone vegan? I think the reason is this. Um, when a person sits down and they eat meat or dairy, uh, that fat gets into their bloodstream and that fat tends to be more the saturated fat that makes your blood thicker more viscous that's the technical term it's more like oil less like water so your blood is 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 thicker more viscous it doesn't circulate as well you don't oxygenate your muscles as well you don't oxygenate your brain as well it's two o'clock in the afternoon you had uh lunch before with gravy and chicken wings and you fall asleep because you're just not oxygenating all that's gone from your diet now you stay awake so it's it's good you made that change yeah, that question, it, it makes me think of our colleague, uh, Dr. Vanita Rahman, who is just an avid swimmer. She's talked about that on the show previously. I, I doubt that she waits the recommended 30 minutes either, but I'll have to ask. Um, but uh, gentlemen, uh, that is uh, all the time that we have here for the doctor's mailbag today. So let's go ahead and close that up. And I will ask this of you uh, who is watching right now. If you liked what you heard, you feel like you raised your health IQ by a point or two, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and like this video. Super, super, super important. And if you're listening to the podcast, on Apple Podcast or Spotify, go ahead and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee as well and leave a five-star rating there if you would be so kind. And last bit of business is the most important bit of business for the entire day. And that is to let you know that today's episode has been brought to you by the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund because their support of the exam room live and the physicians committee is helping to raise our health IQs and the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations just like the physicians committee that carry on Greg's love for animals and they're doing it by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse, two things near and dear to our hearts. And you can visit the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund online right now at GregoryRyderFund.org. That's Gregory Ryder, spelled R-E-I-T-E-R, Fund.org. And you can learn more about them, who Greg was, just a phenomenal human being. And while you're there, you can also subscribe to their newsletter so you can keep up with everything that they have going on. And it is a lot, believe you me. And Dr. Barnard, as we talk about each and every time, uh, Allison Mahoney, uh, and, and the crew there, they, they just are doing such extraordinary work. They have supported us and have supported the cause that we share in extraordinary ways. And they, they, they deserve so much gratitude. So thank you, Allison. Thanks to everybody at the, at the Greg Ryder Fund. And Dr. Barnard, you deserve a deep debt of gratitude for me today for taking the time and answering so many questions. And same to you, Dr. Cullimore. Thank you so very much for making your debut today. I hope you had fun. Oh, it's been great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Chuck. And I also want to say thank you to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen. And to you, my exam roomie, thank you for being here and raising your health IQ right alongside of us. For everyone at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>